Hello, everyone. My name is Ola Rotinio Bumbebin from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Today, I'll be presenting on unnecessary digital storytelling for environmental advocacy in the global south or in Africa. In the digital age, you know, storytelling has transcended its traditional boundaries, evolving into a dynamic tool that leverages multimedia platforms to engage audiences more profoundly. Digital storytelling can mobilize communities by presenting narratives that resonate with their values and experiences, thereby fostering a participatory culture. This evolution is particularly pertinent in the context of environmental advocacy, where compelling narratives, you know, uh, helps illuminate complex issues and inspire action. This conversation storytelling in Africa, you know, it can help in different ways. One, to amplify marginalized voices. Conservation storytelling, you know, in Africa serves a dual purpose. One, it amplifies the voice of marginalized communities and fosters a nuanced understanding of environmental stewardship through the lens of African sociocultural realities. And it can also help to challenge you know, prevailing discourses. How is that possible? By drawing on indigenous knowledge and contemporary experiences, these narratives you know, can challenge prevailing discourses, offering alternative perspectives that underscore the interconnectedness of human and ecological well-being. It can also help to inspire action through the prism of digital narratives we aim to illuminate the pathways through which storytelling can contribute to a more nuanced and engaged approach to environmental conservation across the continent. Now, digital storytelling, educational advocacy, integrating indigenous knowledge and addressing environmental justice concerns, you know, will uh, form the basis of the theoretical orientation for the study. So digital storytelling, you know, characterized by the use of digital media to create and share narratives has emerged as a transformative tool in educational advocacy providing a platform for interactive engagement and broader dissemination. Integrating indigenous knowledge and local cultural narratives into digital storytelling can enhance its relevance and impact. In the process, you know, fostering, fostering a deeper connection with audiences' values and experiences. And by acknowledging and valorizing local wisdom, you know, conservation storytelling can promote respect for cultural diversity and environmental sustainability. And in the process, again, you know, addressing environmental justice concerns. Then we also, you know, be relying on community-based feed methods for localization. Community-based research is done you know, in local places, usually the feed, with local communities, you know, who inform research questions, the methods of data collection, the interpretation of results, the research products that aim to be usable and useful to local communities. Engaged and placed and embodied research. Ethical feed methods naturally engage you know, with place as a collaborator that influences the research design and more. In many cases, feed works you know, can help scholars include usually marginalized sources, you know, like everyday material objects, vernacular discourses and embodied experiences, to understand rhetorical work as a form of responsibility, responsive, responsibility, I'm sorry, responsibility and 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 in response. And Participatory localization is not just translation, but rather you know, a user-driven approach in which a user, that's an individual or the local community, identifies a need 
or work to the designer or developer to develop a mutually beneficial product that mirrors the social, cultural, economic, linguistic, and legal needs of the user. So some of the uh, findings that we got from interacting with um, <clears throat> uh, some climate conversations, you know, that we got from podcasts, from YouTube interviews and interactions, you know, among uh, environmental enthusiasts, you know, in, 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 in Africa, you know, across Africa, uh, will form the discussions that we'll have in these sections. And the first one we talked about is the colonial, post-colonial impacts. You know, <clears throat> I'm talking about, you know, like how the arrival of British colonial authorities, you know, led to the documentation and formalization of indigenous practices into what we were termed the Barrels of Forest Ordinances in Kenya. And <clears throat> also have, you know, the Lozi speaking people's practices. So the Lozi people's specific rules, you know, around tree conservations demonstrate an integrated approach to environmental management, where cultural practices, ecological knowledge, and spiritual beliefs are intertwined. And they guide, you know, how people, you know, protect the environment and even, you know, which reacts to climate change. It was a transformation of local practices. The transformation of these local practices into formal ordinances illustrates how indigenous, indigenous knowledge you know, can influence and shape broader environmental policies and legislation. Then we also have an example from Kiki community's approach, uh, relying on cultural and, and, and the spiritual you know, aspects of the lives of these people. And it could use communist approach, you know, the process of only taking what was necessary from the river and allowing the rest to flow downstream exemplifies a sustainable and equitable approach to resource usage, usage ensuring that all community members and even downstream communities had access to essential resources. So this would definitely go against you know, the, the, the dictates of capitalism, for example, you know, where the strongest and probably the richest you know, will take it all and probably just leave uh, what you cannot take you know, to people on the, in, in the downstream. We also have taboos and rules you know, that govern the interaction with natural resources. And this deeply reflects, you know, cultural underpinnings of environmental and management practices among the Kikuyu. And we also find that, you know, from these conversations that there is um, um, inclusivity, inclusivity, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, inclusivity and community engagement. And <clears throat> so that there were, uh, members of community, you know, local community members who willingly and voluntarily, you know, participate in, in conservation. And in, in one of the interviews from the podcast that we have here, you know, it highlights over 100 volunteers who, you know, rallied to protect endangered cranes. And the inclusiveness, you know, demonstrates a, a broad-based approach to community management where everyone, everyone has a role to play in conservation. And what this fosters is that sense of shared responsibility and, and collective action you know, among local population. So the discussion on the potential of digital storytelling, one, it helps to amplify, to amplify marginalized voices. You know, to illuminate indigenous wisdom and to challenge prevailing narratives of environmental management and conservation. And like we just said, inclusivity and empowerment. So digital storytelling emerges not just as a method of communication, 
but as a form of empowerment. And when you engage, when you let community members feel involved, when they know that their voice will no longer be marginalized and that they can also become, you know, force for change and a catalyst for change. So this, you know, help these communities to assert their agency and to share their experiences and advocate, you know, with others for a sustainable future. Then digital stories, you know, can also help to educate and sensitize, sensitize you know, uh, uh, the public in the process, play a significant role in challenging environmental injustices by spreading knowledge, by altering perceptions and motivating action. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation.